Michael Jackson. I got to know him really well personally over 10 years, so I know the truth. What's now. the craziest story of bodyguarding for Michael? I said to him, this is going to be a bad idea. He must have known it. Being coached by Michael Jackson and competing with Michael Jackson drove Matt Fidesz to personal and business success. Thank you to all my team and Matt Fidesz. Yes! I'd love to take credit for that, but it was Michael Jackson who pushed me to do that. And he just ripped into me. I used to dodge his phone calls. Michael's on the phone, time I ring him back. Oh. Now with a business worth well over 100 million, Matt Fidesz is UK Franchiser of the Year, UK Entrepreneur of the Year, and he's leading people to success and generational wealth. I'll be billionaire by the time I'm 50. People say money doesn't matter, but being poor is not much fun. What are you gonna do when you're a billionaire? No different to what I'm doing now. Build a 100 million pound business, stay humble, become rich in every sense of the word. Would you say that that is one of the cornerstones of your success in that business? Yeah, absolutely. If you haven't got people talking about you, then there's something wrong. Imagine Michael Jackson saying to you, what have you done? What drives you? Let's do this. I've um, tried to commit suicide three times. They didn't know how to deal with me. So I was turning up to counselling and my mate who just died is the most famous man in the world. They didn't know how to deal with that. I ended up cuddling the counsellor because she was so upset. Welcome to the BizX podcast, sharing with you all of the secrets and winning formulas in both business and life with powerful lessons from guests like Frank Bruno, Nick Jenkins, Brad Sugars, Bianca Westwood, and many, many more. Yet, the sad reality is that over 80% of you aren't subscribed yet. And if that's you, hit the subscribe button now and help us grow this channel so that you can get 1% closer every single week to achieving your dreams in both business and life. Let's do this. Um, so you built a business to over a hundred million. You know, I've done a little bit of homework there. What are the keys to building a business to that point? I think it all starts off with pain points, James, when uh, you have that fire in your belly to, to keep on going and pushing forward and not give up and, and uh, make it happen. I, if I went, if I was to go back, I wouldn't have gone and pushed it to the extent that it is that now. Why not? But once you get past like the 10 million mark, your life don't change. <laughs> yeah, I know it's, but I'm wired in a different way. You, you can only buy so, so many houses, so many holidays you can take, so many sports cars, supercars you can have. Your life don't change. Anything else really is just like generational wealth for your kids and, and um, being able to help people out and change people's lives is what motivates me to do it. But yeah, pretty much, I think 10 million is like the new million now from what it was 20 30 years ago being a millionaire now, i don't really mean it it doesn't does it a million nah. used to be a life-changing amount of money 80s 90s you probably have stopped at 90s but now it's it's probably a few million but you're saying 10 million now 10 million is the new million yeah yeah and all the friends who i hang out with and stuff that's kind of where what, we'll, what we all mentor and teach get yourself to the 10 million mark and then get yourself five percent passive income on that and then you're done as you were answering that the thought did go through my mind, you know, basic business sense this. A business that's turning, let's say, a million with a 200k profit is better than a business that's turning 10 million with a 200k profit. Yeah. Because and, and, cause it's not necessarily about the top line, is it? It's, it's definitely got to be about the bottom line. It has to be. People always talk about turnover all the time, don't they? And like I have to say, like, turnover is um, vanity and profit sanity. And yeah, it's no point. I, I got one of my clients does two million a year and has one hundred fifty thousand a year profit. I mean, it's, what's the point of that? You you have to have a real high pref, profit rate. And I've always been real tough with my businesses. My main core one, I have an eighty five percent profit rate. We literally have no overheads really. It's my franchise business, and that's unusual. People trying to work with ten fifteen percent margins is hard to get anywhere. So eighty five percent gross profit. Yeah. 85% gross profit and yeah, I mean, yeah wow it's, that, that's high I mean how many franchises have you got worldwide we've got worldwide just over 1800 so we're the biggest we've ever been and we're going to expand another 2000 over the next couple of years and we're, we're pushing hard on it we've had a, you see you can double the business in the next two years yeah I, I can't tell you the full details yet but we've we're halfway through an acquisition of another big company where I'm going to put an MF martial arts and MF dance inside this other company and they got 5,400 locations. So that's going to speed things up quite dramatically and put us in 53 countries too. So. Up to now, have you grown everything organically? Yeah. Yeah. It's just all been all organically from the world of hard knocks, really. I mean, I had no qualifications at school or anything. I had no investment. I had hundred pounds savings from working two pounds 25 as a lifeguard. 
and a lot of damn motivation. I surrounded myself with the right people and uh, that's what got me to where I am. I knew my life wasn't going to be normal, but not to this extent. But so, what have been the highlights? What have been the highlights of, of building that business? Well, when you can when you can turn your passion into your profession, something you love to do, and there's no greater feeling than watching people's lives change, and not just focused on the money. The money is just a byproduct. That's just something that if you if you're delivering an incredible service or product, the money is a byproduct actually doing something you love for a living. So initially for me, it was just teaching martial arts. That was it. That was all I wanted to do. I didn't want to do a normal job. I certainly didn't want to work as a lifeguard anymore for £2.75 an hour. That was painstaking, living in a bed sitter. We got evicted from the first three bed sitters, so £30 a week. And it was painful, but also probably motivated me to be where I am now. When you do something you love, it's not work. So I quite happily get up and I work until... I fall asleep like one, two in the morning and I love it. I mean, it's just not work to me. It's what I do. And people always ask, why are you still working all these hours? But I, so you, I you started it. as a martial arts teacher yourself. Yeah. Because that's your passion. Yeah. Or purpose. And that was always meant, ever meant to be trying to figure that one out because no one ever done it before. So how could I teach martial arts for a living? The thing I love. When did you stop teaching and start building the business? So I started really young, right? So I started martial arts when I was seven. I left school, no qualifications. I did a PT qualification, which took about six months. Then I went for it at 16 and started up my own classes in a place called Braunton in North Devon, like a little village of 10,000 people. And it, it was okay. I mean, I was doing all right, but yeah, looking back, I was just a kid, right? I, I, I did funny little things too, James. Like I wanted to look older because people take me seriously. So I grew this ponytail. I read somewhere that men with long hair look older and it kind of worked in a way clearly and um i started off literally three pound a class and put them in like one of those big ice cream containers and taking the money to the, the bank just teaching on a wednesday night and a sunday night my overheads were 30 pound a week and that was that i was making about 100 pound a night i was doing okay to be honest back then it was a couple hundred pound a week and my parents were against it my grandparents were against it but i just knew somehow that it was going to be okay and then the next stage was there was all this fuss being made about what was going on in the USA. And back then, it's true to say America was 20 years ahead of what we are in the UK in terms of business and information. Yep. Now we've got the internet, so we've got access to stuff like this. It's really quick. So a friend of mine came back from Florida and he'd been on holiday there and just randomly been walking around and bumped into these amazing martial arts businesses where people are multimillionaires. And he, and he came back and I remember... I, I'm not that old, I'm 44, but sounds like I'm old. I got a pager, because that's how we started the business off. He paged me and he said, Matt, you've got to call me urgently. I remember walking from my bed sit to a red telephone box, because they were a proper thing back then, <laughs> ringing them up. He's called Lee. And I said, Lee, what's what's going on? And he said, uh, Matt, I've just come back from the States. You wouldn't believe it. They're multimillionaires. They've got thousands of members. And I said to him, I want the standards to be good. So they got the standards too. They got everything. So I saved up my £2.75 an hour as a lifeguard, my three pound a class and I got on a plane to a big conference over there and it was three days of information what we call now content no pitching it's a bit nowadays you go to these events are very much yeah. a lot of pitching going on none of that it was just telling you how to do things and get on with it and the owner of the conference a guy called Nicholas Kokinas who's in his 80s he wasn't a martial artist but he was a business guru so he did this with the dance industry and he went on to the martial arts industry and he made it professional educational and so forth. And he, he was so impressed I used my last money and flew out there. I was 17 then. That he said, listen, I went and introduced myself to him. That's what happened in the reception. And he said, no one ever does that. So I have that confidence at 17 years old to use your last money and introduce yourself to a, he, This guy owns shares in the Marriott's hotels. He's mega, mega wealthy. And um, he said to me back then, he said, I, I'm going to make you rich. I was make you famous at the same time. So he took me under his wing. And he said, go and follow this person in Florida, this person in San Francisco. And I literally did that. I, whatever he told me to do, and he would mentor me. And, I, and the whole idea was that I'll be his ultimate case study because he didn't know if he was going to work in England. And I was so young. And he did not say he used me. It was a transactional agreement. But yeah, with a short story, a long story made short, within a, within a year, I was making a million pound a year profit. A million pound a year profit? Yeah, I had no overhead. So, I mean, it's, it's a building with an empty room. I couldn't afford mats. It was just carpet, cheapest carpet I could afford. Partition is taken down. My rent was about £220 a month. And I had 700 students paying 
59 and the family rates run about 100 pound and gradings and merchandise and joining fees it soon adds up 80,000 a month could not believe it. I thought, I thought wow this is like uh when you were 18 now I'm 17 no, 19. I'm 19. that was no but when you got the million mark yeah I, was, oh. I went straight in there I, literally I, they gave me six months free rent for the building because they think it was going to work I managed to do deals to get those office space to get the partitions taken down and um yeah, it, it, within that six months, I packed in 700 members in there. It was the biggest martial arts school in the UK. Were you profit-focused at that point? No, nah, not at all. W what were you focused? Service-focused. So it was all about providing the best, being the perfect role model. M marketing was the number one thing. I was, I, I was extremely... I don't know, I always knew that I had to be aggressive. And this guy in his 80s, he was always like, you need to be more aggressive. And I'm thinking, Mr. Keenis, what else can I do? I mean, I'm putting leaflets to the door at 5 a.m., putting posters everywhere... I'm doing everything, but he said, now you've got to be more aggressive. And I was literally, everywhere you look was Matt for those martial arts schools. They were just surrounded. Yeah, and members were, I mean, I, there's this rule, people got to see things like seven times before they respond. Back then, it was like 20, 30 times I was in people's faces, ringing in their ears when they're walking around this town in North Devon, yeah. And then what I did then, I went, I thought, is this luck or whatever? And it's quite an isolated place, North Devon. The next town was Biddeford, which was 20,000 people. You still live in Devon now, yeah? Yeah, yeah, not far from there, about 30 miles from there. So I did it again in Biddeford, Ilfacombe, South Moulton, Torrington, and that was all the five towns done. Now, the nearest town from there was 40 miles away, so in my head I thought, no one's going to work for me and travel that far. And I was making a million and a half profit a year, so I was done, literally. I had the Ferrari 355, which was one of my goals to have, or my when I wrote, sat in my maths class, I wrote down all these goals and it, having a Ferrari 355, being a millionaire every time I was 20, being the most well-known martial arts instructor. And I, and I did all of that by the time I was 19. So I used to stare at that. Those what would you say to day. a 19-year-old now that's operating in a slightly different business climate? Mm. You know, you were doing all of the leaflets and all this kind of stuff. What would you say to a 19-year-old now that wants to also to be get the 1.5 million? I think setting the goals and writing them down is, is a must. I mean, I can't explain my... We'll get on to more of what happened next, obviously. It went things up to its game a bit. But I can't explain my crazy life. I do believe in the law of attraction, whatever you focus on, what you get. None of us really know how that works. Obviously, one of my best mates is Yuri Geller, and he thinks we only use 10% of our yeah. our brain. And he really... He's proven that to me on, on many occasions. So, so I think for anyone out there at the moment, you need to be surround yourself with the right people. If you surround yourself with five millionaires, you'll be number six. If you're five billionaires, you'll be number six. If you're five broke people, you're going to be broke. Uh, and also, you, you're in the online world, but you mustn't forget that you. I built my business in the offline world. So we had MySpace, email, no Facebook or anything like that. So, MySpace? Does it still exist, MySpace? I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe someone out there will let you know, but I don't, I don't think so. But what I did is, even now, all my franchises are taught. Every single month, they need to have 15 offline activities planned for and executed. And then they have, on, on top of that, they have their online. They mustn't rely on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Because you get deplatformed, you, you, you're screwed. So we, we teach this to all my clients. That don't forget the offline world. Might have people lose their So they've accounts. got to have 15 offline strategies? By the 5th of every month. Yeah, so they can prepare and get them in place because they take a bit more time. Facebook ads, you get up and running in two minutes. You know what you're doing. If you're all about doing promotions within schools or or newspapers or media stuff, that takes a bit of planning. So you need a couple of weeks to get it done. So by the 5th of every month, they need to have 15 offline activities as, as well as their online stuff in place and and do that every month. So they, they've got three weeks to sort now, out. You know, that's, that's what you're doing with all of your franchises around the world. So there's 1,800 of them. But on a micro level, I suppose that could work for a business, couldn't it? You got a marketing yeah, yeah. manager, like on the by the fifth of every month, you got our fifteen offline strategies. I teach that to all my business. So the other side of my business is business mentoring, and I've got over five thousand of them, of entrepreneurs, investors, and stuff. And I just teach the exact same strategies because they they ring up the simple problems. Oh, I've lost my Facebook account. I've lost my Instagram. Well, you should have all this offline stuff in place. You can't just rely on Zuckerberg and Meta. It's just madness. You know, and you can't communicate with these guys when you when you lose the stuff. You know, you can't get all of the the Facebook team. It's happened to us. But my my franchise, if they lose their Facebook account, they don't care less. They've got everything else in place. So it's probably not communicated enough right now 
the power of offline. It's massive. Like, do you know when they say, like, mainstream media is dying? It baffles me. and No one's bothered about it. Well, I use mainstream media massively. You know, when property dies, James, what do you do? You go in and take advantage of it, don't you? When it crashes, mainstream media is crashing, go in and take advantage of it. Get on TV, get on the radio, get in the newspapers, you know, get, see how you get case studies out there. Uh, so on a weekly basis, I'll, you'll see stories about me on the Mail Online. Yeah, it's nothing like it used to be. Like, it used to be 20, 30 million copies per day back when I was first involved in media when my story broke. But it's there to be used, and it goes viral, and it will send traffic to your social media and also help you with your offline media. It's just one of those seven things, yet again, you should be doing. So I work mainstream media extremely hard because it's dying, because it's an opportunity. I'm buying properties again now like I've never done before because they're crashing. Would you say that that is one of the cornerstones of your success in that business, offline marketing? Yeah, absolutely. Offline marketing is, is um, underrated. and you know, Most entrepreneurs now don't even, don't even think about it, do they? They don't want to even give a second thought to a leaflet or a poster or you know, a billboard. You know, working with the communities, working on these uh, with the schools to get to the parents for your clients, they don't even think about it. What else is, is a cornerstone to success be besides the offline strategies? I, I surrounded myself with the, the best people ever. Not intentionally. I mean, this first guy obviously is his 80s. Now, that... That led on to me to get discovered by the the, the UK media, and they re reported Billy Boy becomes millionaire, and it was front page of the Daily Mail, Sun, and every UK newspaper. It was massive, and and then back then we we're talking like ninety seven, ninety eight. It was huge to be uh, that kind of coverage. Like phones were ringing off the hook, and every TV station wanted me. So I did a lot. Some people probably remember these shows, the morning TV show. I did Trisha, Esther Ramps, and Kilroy, um, Richard and Judy. GMTV, all based on the fact Bully Boy becomes millionaire. They they liked the fact I used it as a motivator. They were trying to find my bully, which they did in the end, which we'll come to later. But I, yeah, that that made me, and then threw me into the spotlight, and I got discovered by Yuri Geller, who became my closest friend, and he wanted to make a VHS tape with me on stopping stopping bullying. So he would do like mind power, staying positive, avoid conflict, and I'll do like the self defense side of things. And we became best buddies. He's actually godfather to my eldest daughter, Madison. And he introduced me one night to Michael Jackson. And uh, yeah, then the rest was history. I went to a mega brand then, from five schools to... So Rodeo. he introduced you to Michael Jackson. What happened next? Yeah, so, so Uri called me up one night, three in the morning, which is not unusual because he's got businesses all around the world. And he said, come to my house now, or you're going to regret it, which I did. And I met Michael in his living room. We got on really well. He wanted to meet me. He was very much into martial arts. He's already a black belt. His dad made the Jackson 5 uh, learn all that. And, um, and there was no bodyguard talk initially. We were just friends for the first year or so. And I used to go out and see him and hang out with him. And he, he was, I think Yuri was looking for someone to put in his inner circle that he could trust. I was already making millions. Didn't need Michael's money. And the martial arts side of it, I don't know if the conversation was ever had, but I think the back of Michael's head, he kind of knew that I could take over his security operation because of all the instructors I had behind so me. So how were you still making the money whilst you were doing that? Were you getting other people to deliver the classes? Yeah, yeah. I, I got out of teaching real quick. So how quick? Very quick. Within like a, maybe like a year. I mean, that's a key thing. You've you got to be working on your business and not in it. That's the thing I struggle most with my franchisees and my clients now is that they don't understand the concept they a lot of them have got a job they got to build up so they're working on their business not in it you can't escape and it scale and grow unless you get to that stage but i got i had that done quite quickly and yeah when i pulled myself out of, out of teaching because it was matt for martial arts schools my name above the door people didn't like it and i lost 15 20 percent of my students but then i had more time to spend on the real stuff that matters which is marketing and um being being aggressive on that side and i it just doubled instantly and they soon forgot about me, and they had I had a team there. So I mean, it's a good little takeaway message, you know. Get off the tools as soon as you can. How how old were you when you got off the tools? Nineteen. And you know, it's twenty five years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. You got off the tools twenty five years ago. Yeah, yeah. I just work when I want to work. And now you're doing way over a hundred million. Yeah, I just work when I want to work, and it's it's okay. But when you actually get to the destination, James, it's um. It's kind of interesting because you wish for all these things and you get there. Like my wife, she she keeps me, I, was like, I am very grounded, but sometimes she catches me staring over the hills at our mansion in Devon and 
and um, I know I feel like there's I've not really achieved much. She's like, well, you need to wake up sometimes, Matt. Look where you are. Yeah, you know, you know, early forties, you've made it big time, and are you? You do forget though. Are you a modern age leader? Um, I I try to be. I try to. I keep up to date with everything. My network is very enclosed. Uh, you, you, you've interviewed some of my network today. We exchange ideas, all the cutting edge stuff I'm on top of, and I deliver that back to my franchises and my clients. So that's, I see that as my duty, to lead them and navigate through this crazy world we're in. So the latest trend I'll bring to them as quick as I possibly can. What, and execute what, what are your core personal attributes? My core personal ones. I... I am quite to the point of can be my own mistakes. I'm a bit too given sometimes, I think. I'm extremely motivated. I, I like what I get to do is what keeps me going. I, you know, I, people say money doesn't matter, but it flipping does. I mean, it's like being poor is not much fun, being poverty. And mm. I get to do some great things. I won't publicize the stuff that's not public, but behind the scenes, I, I lost my mum to breast cancer when she was 56 and I was 32. So I pay for a lot of people's operations because they don't have to wait months on the NHS. Um, a lot of the time, they don't even know it's me. They just It just gets done. And I help out the local hospices who the kids are dying or the mum's dying and wants their kid to be able to go out in a supercar. So I'll take a Lamborghini or a Ferrari up, drop everything at the last minute. Don't don't publicize the fact I just do it. I get to do all this stuff because I'm rich, and also changing people's lives. It's 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 just incredible. I love making people millionaires. I just love it. I think getting people to be financially free, where they don't have to look at receipts anymore, and experience that life, and it rubs down on on the kids. But my main motivator for me, I got six wonderful children. I have a great relationship with them all, and I I do believe the world's going to be a tough place. It is a tough place anyway. There'll be more future lockdowns, pandemics, global warming, ones. There's all sorts going on, so. It's about building generational wealth for them. I want to build enough wealth to take care of my great, great, great grandchildren. And I, I just feel that's my duty. And I, all my franchises too, I treat them like they're my family. I've actually spent more time with my senior franchises than I have my own family. I mean, that's in adult life. They are like my, my brothers and sisters. You know, they're, what, what's, the, what's the difference between a senior franchise and... Well, they've been with me like 20 years plus. Yeah, right. I got one that's been me twenty five years, right from the very beginning, pretty much. Do the people that n that are not the senior franchises ever take that personal that phrase? Yeah, it's a good question. I never asked them actually. <laughs> it does get thrown around. Yeah, they probably do, but they they know they aspire to the, the the senior lot because they they are the leaders. They're the ones making the big money, or they know how to retain their students. Though they know how to market well, so they look up to them as well. But yeah, that, that is a good question. I think they all aspire to be part of that group. We have our like our own little meeting with them, the seniors, and then we do the others. They have to work their way up to get into that that level of networking. Otherwise, they just get overwhelmed. Yeah, well, overwhelms overwhelms happens in business. Yeah, you know because you you, you think about someone starting a business today. I mean, I don't know if you can relate to this. You were seventeen when you did it. Yeah. Um, the. Oh, you get my bad. Where'd you start? Yeah, All the well, fake gurus online and but yeah, what do you terrible. take note of? What do you not take note of? You got to manage the finances. You got to build the business. You got to do the marketing. You got to do the sales. You you're probably on the tools yourself. Yeah, I think I think it's I have this I I have this kind of like um, I'm sure you do too. I'm very ethical in what I do, and I won't teach or mentor anybody in something I've never done before, and unfortunately after the pandemic especially there's so many people who set themselves up with coaches consultants or mentors and all they've really done is built this framework they've never actually done it before and that really frustrates me because these, these kids or young entrepreneurs are spending all this money with potentially somebody who's never done it and i've challenged a few people about this change before i said to them i won't name anyone there's someone who's, who does like a million a year never made any success in the industry they're in yet they're selling masterminds, courses on the back of it. And that's what makes them a million. Yeah, and I say to them, you know, because they ask, they ask me advice, pull me aside, Matt, I need to look like I'm doing well in this industry. What can I do? And I, and I said to them, do you, do you really think it's right for you to be selling these masterminds and courses? Because you've not actually done it yourself, made it. You, you look like you made it. You've got the car, you've got the impressive building, all the rest of it, a nice house, but you shouldn't be asking me that. And they're like, well, it's down to the client to do the due diligence as far as they're concerned, not them. They're, and the strange thing is now, you're in a world now where 
they buy without asking them, can I see your bank statements? Can I see some social proof for the last two or three years? Can I have access to your accountants? When I started off my franchising, James, I had to, I'd be working with the other size lawyers for full disclosure. If I go on TV shows like Rich House, Poor House, because of Ofcom, I have to give my properties up, my bank statements, everything, so that they can categorize me in my net worth. And that's all gone now. It's all gone. It's, it's just people just buying from people without checking them out. And that's sad. And I think they should. I got, I got, I'm okay because I, I got social proof going right back to when I was 17 on Google and news stories, good, bad, ugly. The whole works is there for me. So people know when they work with me, they get the real deal. But there's, who's, who's the emphasis on? Is it the people who are buying it, who's not doing their due diligence? Or is it the person who's faking it? Fake it till you make it, so I call them. I sound them stuff. But yeah, it's a good debate, that one. But I don't, it don't sit right with me. I think you need to be there and done it. You know, like your action coach, I mean, everyone knows about Brad Sugar. He's been there, done it. That yeah. guy's been through the thick and thin. You know, he was one of the leaders, one of the original. I remember reading his books when I was 17. Billionaire or something, I can't remember what it's called. Billionaire now. in training. Yeah. That's right, yeah. I remember reading that. Are you a billionaire in training? I would, I'll be billionaire by the time I'm 50. Another five years? Six years? Six years, yeah. Yeah, I'll be billionaire by the time I'm 50. If it carries on, it will carry on, so I'll make sure it will. If it carries on cruising like it's doing at the moment, it'll be done by the time I'm 50. So, When did you decide to franchise? Okay. Because so, that, that is a, a huge leveraged model now. Yeah, I, I'd love to take credit for that, but it was Michael Jackson who pushed me to do that. Why? Um, so I was in a hotel not far from here, Higher Holborn, Renaissance Hotel, with Michael. And we were here, he had a business trip here for 10 days. And I was hanging out and bodyguarding him. And I was in his living room in the suite of his hotel. And he, he was very inquisitive about what other people do. Because people with billionaires and superstars, so they get asked all the time, you know, they get sick about talking about Billie Jean and Thriller and all the rest of it. So he's, he's like, Matt, how's your business going? So I've got these five locations in North Devon. My nearest town is 40 miles away, but I can never get anyone to go there. You can't tell someone like Michael Jackson, you can't do anything, he, you know, look what he's achieved. And he just ripped into me, man. That Mike just said... Uh, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm from Gary, Indiana. I'm one of nine kids living in a two-bed house. My dad didn't even have shoes to go to work for the steel mill. We had handouts from the street, and I'm all around the world. I've got the biggest album in the world, Matt, called Thriller. Have you heard of it? I said, of course I've heard of it. He said, you've got to expand this. You get someone to go 40 miles. I said, I can't. I can't do it. I'm, there's no way. I was at like early 20s at this point, 21, 22. And he said, sure you can. It's called franchising, building a brand. And I, and I threw it back to him and I said, Mike, no one's ever done franchise in the martial arts before. And I remember he pointing to me, he said, that's exactly why you got to do it. And he wrote down on his napkin at the Renaissance Hotel, all these things I had to do, like build a brand, put everything in manuals, business in the box, basically manipulate mainstream media, get out there, be aggressive with the marketing. And then he introduced me to his licensing lawyer. He had, for people who don't know, he had the biggest endorsement of all time with Pepsi Cola. I think it was like 70, 80 million. It was a thing. He was one of the first celebrities to get that. So he introduced me to his licensing lawyer and they looked at what I had. And essentially I had I had a franchise. I just had to manualize everything. I, I've, I duplicated it five times. So things got quite exciting then because I'm thinking, geez, can I really do this 40 miles away? So I tested. That was a town called Tiverton. That's where I live now. That one went straight to a couple hundred members in no time at all. But then the trouble I had then, I left that conversation with Michael. I was hoping he was never going to revisit it again. But literally every <laughs> phone call he made to my house every time. We, we Why were you hoping that? Because he was tough on me. I know people for the company think, oh, really him? You don't get to be the most famous man, biggest album in the world, billionaire like Michael, unless you know what you're talking about. You know, he was so tough on me. Like, God, Yuri was too. Yuri was tough on the property side. Got to buy five houses a month. I love him for it now. I've got the biggest privately owned property for in southwest of the UK. And then Michael was tough on building this brand. So the phone calls changed. So it came from, Hank, where are you going to be? Do you want me to help you out? Matt, can you come here? And so on to, hey, Matt, how many schools you're open this month? How many franchises you start? Like, uh, 10? you got to up your game. 20? Let's go. And I'll throw the question back to him. How are you doing, Mike? He goes, I just signed a $100 million deal to tour Korea. And I come off the phone again. This guy's kicking my butt. I need to up my game. You know, but um, yeah, he kept me accountable. And I used to dodge his phone calls. My wife used to laugh at me. <laughs> Michael's on the phone. Time I ring him back. Oh, I, know I used to I, dodge Michael Jackson's phone yeah, calls. Yeah, yeah, all the time. Yeah. He's, like, he's going to ask me how many students I've got now and how many franchises I've sold and all the time. And um, he kept me accountable. Yeah. What's yeah. the craziest story then of bodyguarding for Michael? 
Ah, oh, there was never a dull moment, James. I mean, it was all wild. I mean, that guy just could not go out. Even the taxi driver to come here was he's fascinated about it. You know, everyone's fascinated about Michael Jackson, aren't they? This whole mystery he created on purpose. It certainly were. I know it backfired on him a little bit too. Yeah, I mean, we would try and do simplistic things like catch trains from Paddington Station to come visit me in Devon and stuff like that, and it would all go massively wrong. People would exit the trains, realise that Michael Jackson's on the platform. That's on YouTube. People want to see it, and we'd be pushed up against the train lines. Within minutes, everything would change. We just couldn't do anything. I remember one time he wanted to go to HMV in Oxford Street. And um, normally we, we would shut it down. We'd ring them up, convince them that it's Michael Jackson. We shut it down. But he didn't want to do that. And generally what he wanted to do is quite interesting. He wanted to check that his albums were being distributed right by Sony Music and that the quality of the albums were good. So he wanted to take them back to the hotel. So he just wanted to go to the Michael Jackson section at HMV. So you imagine we turn up, me, him and one other bodyguard, and I said to him, this is going to be a bad idea. And he must have known it. And um, he didn't want it shut down. So it was like an afternoon, like three o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday. We walk in the front door with Michael. Go, and straight away, he goes to the staff. Can you tell me where the Michael Jackson section is? And they, they couldn't believe their eyes, like fascinated. And we got the escalators. And then there's people flicking through CDs on the Michael Jackson section. He's like, hi, how you doing? And he takes history and dangerous and bad thriller. And then within minutes, it's just complete chaos. Even the staff at HMV have left the teals and come over trying to get pictures and autographs. And then um, the escalators are shut off. And then HMV security tell us that we have to go in the fire exit because the whole of Oxford Street is shut down. Everyone said Michael Jackson has gone in there and they're waiting for him to come out. And we're back back in this little tunnel of the fire exit. And Michael's just like this, you know, just... Uh, there we'd have a couple of hours just waiting for the police to come and help us out. Really? Yeah. And I said, you're okay? He goes, yeah, I've had this since I was five years old. This is normal. I don't know any different. I have bored out my brain. So there was nothing fun about it. It was just uh, challenges all the time. It was just always challenges. Just Do you have any regrets about working with him? No, he, he was wonderful to me. I mean, all the stuff that you, you see about him is complete nonsense and all that will come out. They've got the biopic coming out next year, which is going to be the biggest movie of all time. His nephew Jafar is playing him. Obviously, I got to know him really well personally over 10 years, so I know the truth about what Michael. What was he like? Yeah, awesome guy. <laughs> I mean, he had girlfriends, he had wives, and he was trained by Motown, and it was hard to get people to understand this, that he loved his fans. He did never want to upset his fans. So when we go out, he'd be like, fans are going to be intense, but remember, they put me where I am, Matt. And I had to play bad cops sometimes, say, Maybe Mr. Jackson needs to be somewhere, we've got a meeting to go to. And when things got a bit intense, he would never want to do that. Then he also said to us, make sure my life remains the greatest history on earth. So he put the mask on and we'd have to go and run with it. And he was trained by Motown, his record label, from five years old. Never show the public that you've got a girlfriend or a wife, if you're gay or straight or anything, because you can lose half your fan base. So when his brother Tito Jackson got married, he was devastated. He thought that would be the end of the Jacksons. That'd be over. He was deeply upset. And Jermaine got married. And then he realised it's it's not so much of a thing, the way he was brought up. But, yeah, he was heavily into women. He never. It's funny, if you go back and watch these documentaries made about him, right, with Michael, and you've got fans saying, Michael, can I give you a hug? Martin Bashir was a perfect example. Then he said, yeah, sure, you can give me a hug. And then the girl hugs him. And, he said, and then he says, I'll give you a lot more than a hug. But then they put narration over it. If you turn it up, you can hear exactly what Mike's like. It was just a player. He was back of the car. He's called the women fish. Like, Matt, I want you to bring that fish to my room. And like, yeah, it's, it's it's ironic to me, but I, I understand it. I get it. You know, he built this whole persona. We call it personal brand nowadays. Back then it was image. He played the media and it's backfired. He's not here to defend himself anymore. So it takes people like me to do it for him. And and do you proudly do it? I proudly do it. Yeah, that guy was, that guy was so good to me and my family. Well, if my mum was dying, he, he would ring her every day, no matter where he was in the world. Pop in and see her in Kidderminster in the house, and you, yeah, your business arguably wouldn't be worth hundred million plus now, would it? Well, that's that's the big debate, isn't it? I get asked all the time, would you be where you are now, Matt, financially, if it wasn't for Michael Jackson? Well, you don't know if you did come franchising it. I don't know. No, I, I honestly probably not. If he'd have crossed paths with Brad Sugars, he'd have got you into franchising yeah. at the same time. Probably not. And it's not so much him, it's the people that are around him. So my mentors are like Mohammed al -Fayed. I used to go around his house for Saturday nights, have dinner with him. And, you know, he was a billionaire who owns, used to own, he only passed away last year. He owned Harrods, the Ritz Hotel in Paris. So I had some incredible people. What did you learn from him? He was, um, he was also tough on me. I, I, he, he was lovable rogue, Mohammed was. And uh, 
Fayad was very much pointing out to me all the time, especially on weekends, when we'd have our meeting and go have dinner with him on a Saturday night, he'll say, mate, you're so young. Remember, you're here with us talking about ideas where everyone else is out getting drunk and, and um, we're, we're working out how to come up with the next greatest idea. So you've got to do the opposite to what they're doing. You're in the right right place. He really understood that concept that your network is your net worth. So on a Friday and Saturday night, he had you strategizing on business. Yeah. yeah. So when we talk around a table with him, I'd have I remember one particular night, I'd have um, Michael was sitting next to me. Then we had Yuri Geller, Daryl Hannah, the movie star, David Blaine, the magician. I don't know what he's up to nowadays, but he would, he would be there. Britney Spears. And that would be our... And, and these people weren't talking about other people. It would be ideas to change the world and making the next billion and charitable things and when you're in your early 20s that's going to rub off on you whether you like it or not so i was part of this ultimate what you call mastermind that wasn't a word back then james it was we used to call it networking yeah network and i probably i didn't realize it until many years later that i look back and think geez i was a part of the ultimate if you could buy a place into that room with those people you wouldn't be able, you can put money to value on it most but, famous man in the world billionaires and but you didn't. Me. You didn't buy your way into that, though. You you offered services for free. For, for free. Yeah. Bodyguard the big thing. That was the big thing, because he tried to offer me massive money, but I I kind of realised as soon as relationships get transactional, it changes. So I was very firm on Michael. I don't want your money. Don't want nothing. And then he was looking for other ways on, you know, how can I? Because I was doing fairly long hours with him, and my brother-in-law would get involved, and my family would get involved, and look after him one, one would stay the night duty outside the hotel rooms overnight while we we're all sleeping so no one tries to get into michael's room so yeah he yeah I, I think he opened the doors and showed me what's possible and also i was trying to be like muhammad al fired i was trying to be like yuri gell as well and and like michael i was competing against mike i know it sounds ridiculous but i wanted to beat him he was my mate i wanted to uh yeah i, I was big to, deals yeah which is never gonna happen i you know but it was still something to aspire to. When you come back from hanging around with these dudes too, you get motivated as hell, you know? You're just are you fire. that Are you that kind of person for your franchise network now? I'd hope so, yeah. They do tell me that I am. They do. And and um, interesting enough that if I want to get somebody else on board or inspire them, and I, invite, I had someone last Friday who was 21. I see a lot of potential in this person. Got referred to me. Works for one of my franchisees. I invited him up to my house. Took him out of my Lamborghini. Went to Costa with him for an hour, gave him some good advice, went back and he went back and he's absolutely pumped. And it's those little things like that which, which was done to me that makes all the difference. What are the biggest business mistakes you've made? Biggest business mistakes I've made. I've made a lot. And this is why people pay, pay to be part of me, mentored by me, a franchisee or client, because they, they can learn from my mistakes. I think not so much the business side. I've done well with that. It's the, I let my first marriage slip because I was, I don't believe there is work-life balance. That's just thing. You have to, as an entrepreneur, you have to react for your clients and that could be 11 o'clock at night or whatever. Actually, one time it was one thirty in the morning and I had to react. I got companies in Australia too. So, so there is such a thing as work-life balance. And I got six kids, so I'm pretty well qualified to, on that subject. But I, there are times where I, I, I could have turned my phone off, paid attention to my, my my first my colleague my rehearsal wife my three kids with her um they 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 don't hold it against me because i make up for it now you know they they get daddy's not normal and i and there's no fault of my own and uh, i wouldn't change it at all but i think personal mistakes yeah not spend enough time in the first 10 years of business focused on my family putting them first spend more time with my mum i would have gone back and changed big time with that trying to understand my brothers. I don't have a relationship with any of my family. My younger brother, I've got three younger brothers. Uh, my dad's still alive, I have a relationship with him. And that's kind of to do with, you can, in your early 20s, earn all this money and have this network without having some kind of reflection on your personality, ego. It's not normal to be driving a Ferrari 355 at 19 years old in Barnstable with your top off in perfect condition, long air perm, baby oiled up in the winter. And when you wonder why half the town hates you, you know, and think people find it strange. Did you have a big ego? I, I wouldn't say it's a big, e big ego, but I wouldn't. I didn't know any different, James, did I? I never had a normal. I just thought that was kind of normal. I just got told by my mates, you can't say where you've been at the weekend. 
because no one believed me anyway to think I'm flipping loopy until they start seeing me hanging out with Michael in the media and stuff and things. So no, I was just different. Yeah, just who the hell was making that kind of money that age and I could buy anything I wanted to at such a young age. I had no financial. So quick too, from bedsit to owning a mansion, literally. And I was married really early too. So. Has anyone ever told you and given you any feedback on Ego or being yeah. self-obsessed. I got or... one franchise, Chris Faulkner. He's been with me 25 years plus, And he said I was a bit cocky back then and stuff. And But then it's, you know, I don't beat myself over, up over it because how could I have not been? Your best mates are Michael Jackson, you and Gela Muhammad are fired. And you've, you're you going to be different, aren't you? And not just that. I, I tell the story, I told it on stage last Saturday. People would look up to me thinking, wow, he's got a Ferrari 355. He's... And they were a thing back then, like 140k each, or a thing now, the classic cars now. And I was 19, driving around Barnstable. And then I look at them, and I told I tell this story like every Saturday night or Friday night, I used to go down to Blockbuster Video when they were a thing. And so me and my wife it. can watch a video. Yeah, mm. pick it. I used to enjoy that, doing something a bit normal. And on the way back, I used to always loop past and go past and look through the nightclub or people my age doing normal stuff. And I was thinking, I wonder what it's like to be them, not have this kind of pressure that I've got, you know? And they will be looking at me thinking, I want to be like him. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's all experiences. What have you learned about leading an organisation over the last 25 years? You, you've, got to, you've got to be the walking, talking poster. You, you've got to... People need to look at you and you have to represent what they want to become. And I learned this at an early age. So when I was 16, 17, starting this thing up, parents would look at me and think, he's in shape, he's respectful, he's calling me sir, ma'am, using the surnames. And he really does care about my kid or about me to lose weight or whatever it may be. And I was, rather than have an M&M &M on the wall back then, the rapper, they were looking up to me. So I had to represent what their child, what they wanted to become. And the same as a business leader, you need to represent exactly what your ideal client wants to become. So I go out of my way to, to always train, do my best to stay in shape. I don't need the big muscles anymore with this type of thing, but I, I stay healthy. I teach them real lessons. I cut through the nonsense that this won't work, that won't work, do this, do this, because that's what their business with me for. And it's important, I think. Like, like with you guys, you got Brad. I mean, that guy is always in shape. I've never seen him out of shape. He's always, he's got everything worked out, you know, and you just got to follow the blueprint. That's it. It's as simple as that. If people try and come up with all these ideas. Many times I get pitched to after events. Oh, I've got this idea for you. You don't need any more ideas. Just, it's all been done. Unless you want to be like an Elon Musk where you want to get to Mars or something like that. It's all been done. Pretty much everything's been done, right? You don't want to be an inventor because someone's just going to nick the idea of you anyway. And copywriting it and stuff, it doesn't really work. You just need to find something you love, find someone who's doing it already, study them, make it better, and roll it out and get on with it. That's it. Tony Robbins has been teaching this stuff for years. He called it years, called it modeling. You go and read his first book, Unleash the Power Within. He talks about modeling people. Michael Jackson used to study James. He used to get frustrated when he called it the Michael Jackson dance. He said it wasn't. I copied James Brown, Fred Astaire, Charlie Chaplin, all the best out there, and put it into this style. The moonwalk he got off some teenagers he saw in the streets for a, it was called the backslide and he went up to the you teach me how to do that and gave him a thousand dollars and he, he worked on that made it better and created the moonwalk you just you don't need to reinvent the wheel it just needs to get out there and get going all right so your future ambitions take the business to a billion by the time you're 50. oh, yeah, oh take my net worth to a billion the, the business is takes care of itself it's quite funny one of my franchises at the event last friday and uh they, they, they know that I work all hours and stuff, but it's not the lifestyle they want. So they kind of like being a franchisee because someone said to them, um, what's your life like being a Matt's franchisee? So I oh, know I, I work when I want to. But what, what do you do for your work? Because you've got literally other people doing everything else. Yeah, I'm, I'm very active, involved. I mean, I'm, the, the, the thing about being a leader is most of the time when you get called or messaged, it's because there's a challenge. I don't, I don't get positive messages. <laughs> Very much. So the only time they want to speak to Matt Finesse in the Matt Finesse organization is because there's a problem. So I'm, and I, I've pretty much overcome every single one of them. There's nothing that I haven't seen before now. So my day would consist of that and come up with new stuff for them. So this guy, Simon Stovall, he's one of my top franchises, my second biggest one. And he said he loves, he loves being a franchisee of mine because he'll start work at nine and 
do, do his marketing and advertising. He doesn't have to teach anymore, so he's clocked up at five. Then he's up with his wife and kids. And they're like, oh, are you worried about you missing out? Because no, because behind the scenes, I know I've got Matt Fidesz, my eccentric franchisee, working all the hours that God sends, the one in the morning, going to London, going all around the world, meeting all these people and bringing it all back to us. So he does all that, so we don't have to. It's a perfect partnership. And I thought, if you think of it like that, but that's a good, uh, it is. good way so, to sum it up. You know, so you're the mentor to every franchise partner you've got. Yeah, yeah. It's like having that business partner who does... It's dragging them along, basically, and they. But I love it. I won't have it any other way. I always sit there with Netflix, and I do, I do do that to an extent, but not. I watch Netflix documentaries and things like that. I can't really sit for a chick flick very well. What's your favourite movie that you've ever watched? Favourite movie? Oh man, it's sounds soppy, wasn't it? Titanic, I love. Yeah, my wife does. Yeah, and um, I like Wolf of Wall Street in a funny, funny, strange way. Why? Why, why the Wolf of Wall Street? I can relate to it. What decision madness. making? Yeah. madness. Madness. Yeah. That guy went through madness and, yeah. It, it, you know where Michael... Have you been through madness then? I've been through complete and Because when, yeah. when you look on the surface, you you like this swan that's gliding along the lake. Oh, no. I, I, I real, I've I um, tried to commit suicide three times. Um, I'm dying. At, I mean, that was just... She was my rock, man. I mean, she was like the inspiration. She became a solicitor and home study while she brought up her, us four boys because she had to be the breadwinner due to the recession, 1989. My dad became the house husband and she took over and it's what my memories of her just studying. And although I, she's one of 14 children, they're all academic, gone to university. And although I didn't pass any GCSEs at all, she's kind of, all she used to say to me, Matt, you, well, Matthew, she used to say, there's no such word as can't. And she had this belief in me, you know? So, so yeah, I, I went to the dark times. I mean, in 2009, Michael Jackson died, got filed, my wife filed for divorce last year. And then mum calls me up, so I've got six months to live. And then I had uh, one of my family members, very close family members, just kind of got people in his ear thinking, you could do what Matt's done. You know, they're not a martial artist, so you could do what he's done. And, and convinced him to try and set up a, like a Me Too, a number two Matt for this martial arts brand and took away some key members of my staff and a few of my franchises. It wasn't his fault. He got influenced on it. He was only very young, early 20s back then. I would have been young myself, I was like 26, 27. And ever since that, I've never spoke to him or my brothers again and my father again. So, yeah, all in one year I had... And people used to say to me, I had my business partner in Germany, Lance, I was driving him back to the airport and I just bought a brand new Ferrari 360 Spider, And he said, everything you, at the moment, touches the gold map since, for 10 years. You can't keep going on it. Something's going to go wrong eventually. I was like, oh, no, Lance, it's not going to change. And, yeah... All in one year, literally. And it took me about three or four years to recover from all that. I was on antidepressants, sleeping tablets. Doctors were giving me diazepam. They didn't know how to deal with me because I was turning up to counselling, bereavement counselling in a freaking brand new Ferrari. And my mate who just died is the most famous man in the world. They didn't know how to deal with that. I ended up cuddling the counsellor because she was so upset. And doctors were just prescribing me all the time. And But were you thinking of suicide or did you try no, suicide? I tried it three times, yeah. Mad, but, eh? Lonely. But, Lonely as hell. Didn't have the kids. Didn't, didn't have the wife in the big mansion at weekends. Or the sports car thinking, this is not right. Walk, walking around at two in the morning. Yeah, paranoid, don't trust anyone. People were trying to get to me. To be fair, that's why I call my franchisees family. They kept the ship rolling for me over those dark three, four years. And it wasn't until I really met Monique, my wife, that uh, things picked up. She flushed everything down the toilet. And I don't advise anyone to do that, by the way, but that was a sweating for like three weeks and got me back on track but yeah i had all the money i was worth about 30 million then i remember it really well just couldn't understand it mum's coughing going into the grave i'm like wow looking at my three younger children witnessing their nanny going in the grave thinking this don't make sense and i hired the best professors fifty thousand pound here and there on experimental drugs i tried everything and it won't work so a single man and trying to meet a girlfriend too when you're matt for this and worth all this money and have this crazy background is pretty damn tough because they Google you and they've got some preconceived idea when they meet you. And uh, it's hard. So I, I met Monique by accident. My agent, my CV agent said, we need to get you out of UK because it's gonna, the media was just attacking me every day. Michael was dead. You can't defame a dead person. So they were hanging stories on me and Al Fayed and Mark Lester, his best mate. And it was getting intense. So they wanted me to get a break, get off these antidepressants, get off these sleeping tablets. He said to me, I'm going to South Africa to look after a, super, a pop star out there, a singer. She was on tour. Why don't you come and hang out with me at the hotel for a couple of weeks? Get yourself sorted out. Your mum's only got a few months left. I went out there. 
and the pop stars bodyguards wanted to meet me because of michael jackson i had a picture with them and the pop stars now my wife for 13 years we've got three kids together strange eh it works out yeah, could make it up. So when I had to escape it, I came back engaged. My my lawyer's like, "What the hell are you doing? You're gonna be divorced six months." And how long were you in th therapy then before that? Three years. Yeah. What did you learn from that? Um, yeah, you're human, and that you are normal, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, the money is a tool that can be used for great stuff, but. When you don't have your kids around, because I always imagine you soon, I'm the rich one here. I'm going to end up having the kids full time and then the nannies to help me out. And no, nah, it don't work like that. Go and try that one on with the judge. And I thought the judge was extremely unfair to me. I mean, he literally just, I didn't see my kids for like three months until they could have the next court here. And I'm like, what the heck is this all about? And the power that they had, I just felt they treated me a bit overly bad because it was a big deal for flipping Barnstable Court. It should have never been heard there in the first place. My divorce shouldn't have been. People gossip about you all the time. I get it now. I love the haters and the trolls now, but when you're in your early 20s, you really take things personally, you know? Graffiti on the walls, kill map for this. It was pretty, pretty harsh. What would you say to someone else going through that now? you you got to understand that is the key. If you're going to be successful, do you know, the sad thing is, Yuri Geller used to teach me this, is that they... I used to ring him up. I had an article in the North Devon a newspaper that was going to be printed about me, and I was really terrified about it. And it was literally somebody didn't pay, and it was out of my control. A collection company was going to take them to court, but it was, my name was going to get dragged through the mud. I call Yuri Geller up, and I say, look, I've got this paper. And he said, okay, man, let's put things into perspective here. He said, how many copies does that sell? Oh, it's about 30,000 a week every Thursday. He said, well, I've got this massive story calling me a fraud all over the New York Times coming out. Embrace it, love it. They're your free publicists. And that's a Farmer's Weekly, by the way. I love you, Biden, put the phone on me. Yeah. <laughs> they, if you haven't got people talking about you, then there's something wrong. You gotta worry about when people don't talk about you. So now I go out of my way to make sure people talk about me. I want to see the comments box. What do you want, on what do you want a re reputation for? I, I want a reputation for changing people's lives and, and making them achieve financial freedom. And obviously on the byproduct of that is I change children from being bullied like I was underconfident given all these labels now ADHD one two three and four freaking autism this is we didn't have all this when I started off we're just naughty kids or kids full of energy but um I, I want to be known as the guy who, who, who disrupts that and the academic system of the school system is outdated and everything I teach you in it's not just a martial arts martial arts and dance schools are a hook I have my own educational system which is a three-year cycle of life skills where they learn good manners goal setting good debt bad debt what a mortgage is i teach them everything the school system don't teach uh, not, not just drawing dinosaurs like my boys they're not going to secondary school they're going to be home educated because it's just nonsense that they learn there what's the best book that you've ever read that's changed you the most well, brad's watching this but i say billionaire in training <laughs> right? uh I would say, but Rich Dad Poor Dad is still everything that Robert Kiyosaki teaches is still relevant in today's world, even now. So that I must have read that about 30, 40 times in all the books he's done since then. Everything to do with Donald Trump, I've read. Um, Brad Sugars, I've read all this stuff, and um, Tony Robbins, cover to cover, done all his courses, everything you can imagine, even down to the island, I've done a lot. But I would say the most memorable one always, always sticks out is Rich Dad Poor Dad. And I follow that as a blueprint. Property. Cash flow quadrant. Cash flow, absolutely. Yeah, I only buy a place if it's cash flow and I don't bother. So out of all of the trusted advisors that you've had, those people around you, who are the three biggest ones? Must be Yuri Geller, doesn't it? If it wasn't Yuri Geller, then um, it was nothing, none, none of this would have happened. He plucked me from the TV screen and let, trusted me with his world. And it's another level of thinking. Yuri thinks like another level. I mean, that guy is just a... An absolute, utter legend. Everything is possible. Yeah. He's got the biggest vision. Yeah. And he, and, and it's hard for people to comprehend it in the UK. I don't think the UK gives Yuri Geller the praise, but that man is famous in every country in the world. When I get off a plane with him, anywhere in the world, he's recognised and mobbed. And it's not about the spoons anywhere else. It's about mind power, positive thinking. Look, he's understated the power of a vision. You know, you, your potential is simply the gap between your reality now and your vision. Yeah. That's your potential. Exactly. And if you don't have a vision, you don't have potential. Yeah. And and he, he, he just gets it. Yuri just gets it. All right. What's the, what's the first action, the first thing that people should do once they've listened to this? Find something you love that don't want to become work. 
turn your passion, whatever that may be, your hobby into a career, your passion into your profession. Look out there, somebody's already doing it. Either JV with them or study them, what they do. Make it better and just get on with it. Don't wait for it to be perfect because it never will. Like one of my best mates, Rob Moore, says, start now, get perfect later. He's got a book on that subject. you just got to get on with it. And I'm very good at just getting on with it. If I, People used to laugh at me. If I went to an event, by the time I get in the car and I'm on the way back home, I've implemented ideas, the strategies from that event. I don't sit on it. It's in my business by the time I get home. If you ask my mentors, like business-wise, what do you think mate, set Matt Phyllis out from the rest? They say, well, the time he come halfway down the motorway, you'd already put things in place. Speed of implementation. Yeah. I won't hang around months and think about things. I'll just get on with it. I had nothing to lose, did I? I? My back was up against the wall. I had to make this damn thing work and prove my grandparents and my parents right and prove the bully. And the bully, by the way, started this off. He used to kick me in machines and nick my milk and all the rest of it. He made me start martial arts. It actually works for me now. It's my anti-bully ambassador. We met on national TV for the first time in 32 years and, and um, the presenters were scared. It's this morning, that show. I was going to kick him in the head or something and try and manipulate the media, but I shook his hand, thanked him for all he's done, and we're close friends now. So the guy who set this whole empire up, motivated me to give me that hunger and drive. Is He now does anti-bully tours with me and goes on TV and radio with me and stuff. And and they, he talks from both ends. It's fantastic. Really powerful. Yeah, That's, yeah. Because you know, like, I say to the kids, like, if I'm on TV, like, what do you think my bully looks like? And uh, they describe, would you like to meet him? And he walks out and they're like, well, you know. He won an award at the MF Awards last year. It was um, the Inspired Award. He inspired everything. So you turn your pain points into into positive. You know what my favorite thing of all of this interview is? Passion. Find something that you love. Make it better. Max yeah. it. Sell it. Deliver it in this order. Yeah. Scale it. And then financial and Offline freedom. and online. If one thing people can take away from this, cause I don't think... No one teaches this in entrepreneurial world anymore. I will go on stage and just talk about on, offline and people will be like, wow, they're glued to it. But it's just straightforward stuff. You can't just rely on, how can you put your success just on Facebook, Meta and Instagram? You lose that. You lose your business. And I've seen that happen, James. I've seen people lose their Facebook accounts and they damn, what do I do now? My lot don't care. And, and the fact that we've got through 2008 recession, we grew like hell. We got through the lockdown. We grew like crazy. We went from 30 million to 120 million. And then one entrepreneur, franchise of the year and everything else. It's the fact that we had offline in place. We're not reliant just on the norm. We, 15 we, strategies. But a fifth for every month. month. Both. It, what, what, you got to make that, what now, a, aren't you? Yeah, Good 100%. On you. What's been your favourite part of the conversation? This has been very different from my average podcast interview. Normally they go on about Michael Jackson quite a lot. And I understand that because unless he's one of the most Googled person in the world, even all these years after his death. But um, yeah, it's been great because you've, you've hit all the points. And um, and I, I think you've got the balance right between business and I think also if you avoided the Michael Jack MJ part, people are like, well, you've done that for, so you've got to cover it. You've done it in context. But you know, I'm thinking of a round table like this and I've got this picture in, in my mind right now and let's put this picture in everybody's mind. It, it almost like your mental counsel. So this was your counsel. Yeah. You were sat at this table. We had Daryl Hannah here. We yeah. had Dodi Hoff. Uh, not Mohammed Al Fayed here. Yeah, that's uh, house. Yeah, and we had Michael Jackson. Yeah. We had Yuri Geller. Yeah. Uh, who else was there? Was Britney there Spears. Return Britney up. Spears. Yeah. So we've got all these brains around the table. All right, come on, guys. David Blaine. How are we going to. David Blaine, you know, after his magician tricks, it was how are we going to be more successful? Do you, do you know what they used to say? You probably heard this saying before. Small minds talk about people. I said this to one of my daughters last night. Media minds talk about things great minds talk about ideas they were the great minds just talk about ideas that fit is thank you very much it's the best one i've ever done james thank you all. honestly it is you, you... if you like what you hear on the biz x podcast then join us at the biz x conference bringing you more of what you love live on stage and helping you step up in both business and life just click down here for more information